Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Charlie Schlegel is the Director for the Division of Safety Inspection at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. He has over 18 years of experience in the healthcare safety inspection arena, working in the private industry as well as the state government. Charlie is currently responsible for all life safety code inspections and plan reviews for new construction and renovations for approximately 2,000 healthcare facilities throughout Pennsylvania. Charlie, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you very much, Terry Lee, and uh, good afternoon to everybody that's on the phone. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, today's overview, uh, we're really going to talk a lot about the Life Safety Code and its requirements for alcohol-based hand uh, rub placement or hand sanitizers. Um, you'll see that, um, unfortunately, there's lots of abbreviations, yep. so I'll do my best to, to uh, spell them out. But you'll uh, definitely hear me talk about the Life Safety Code uh, throughout, and you'll see that uh, abbreviated as, as LSC. Um, CMS Emergency Preparedness Changes, uh, that's something we'll go over uh, next. Uh, they had some recent updates in earlier uh, this year. And then just some general life safety code requirement updates that uh, a lot of folks uh, could benefit from, uh, you know, either just making sure that they know or there's some cost-saving uh, items that got added to the, the newest edition, which is the 2012 uh, edition that we're using now. And there's some things in there that, that could really help out uh, uh, your facility and being in compliance. So as we talked about, CMS adopted the 2012 life safety code and also uh, the Healthcare Facilities Code, which uh, some folks know as NFPA 99. Uh, you'll see some pictures there of NFPA 101. Uh, you'll hear me talk later in reference to every uh, licensed or certified healthcare facility really should you know, have a, uh, a copy of the book uh, so that you know what you're getting surveyed to. Um, and this is for about 14 uh, facility types to include hospitals. Uh, you'll see ambulatory surgical facilities, or sometimes we call them surgery centers. Uh, nursing homes, or as uh, CMS likes to call them, long-term care facilities. Those are some of the big facilities that uh, have to be compliant with the uh, Life Safety Code and the Health Care Facilities Code. So when you're talking about uh, you know, hand sanitizers, hand rubs, the first requirements came out in about April of 2004. So they've been out there about 15 years, but there's still a lot of uh, you know, confusion over you know, where I can put them, how do I install them. Uh, so that's where we thought it was you know, important to talk about that today. Um, so you'll see here are the sections in that, that code book that I said that everybody should own. Um, you can find it at 18 or 19, depending on if you're new or existing, 326 for hospitals and nursing homes. And if you're a surgery center, surgery, uh, surgical facility, it's 2021 uh, 326. And what you're going to find is the requirements are exactly the same. Uh, so whether you go to the hospital chapter or the surgery center chapter, they're going to be exactly the same, and we'll go over those here shortly. So one of the biggest questions I've been getting a lot is, are alcohol-based uh, you know, hand rubs permitted in operating rooms? Um, and what I'm going to share is the 2012 NFPA 99, uh, section 1513.3. And that way everybody has it in the slide, so in case there's any confusion, you can just show them right here. Here's the section. Here's what it says. And you'll see that alcohol-based hand sanitizers, including those dispersed as aerosols, shall be permitted to be used in anesthetizing locations. So that is your operating room. So yes, uh, well, one of the big things we want to take uh, from today is the ability to, to have these uh, hand sanitizers uh, in your operating rooms. But we're going, to, we're going to have to, you know, follow the rules. There are going to be rules and requirements on, on how to do it. So uh, we're going to get into those here shortly. But this is an important slide if you work in an operating room or have operating rooms and you've been told, no, you can't have it. Uh, yes, you can. We just have to make sure they're installed properly. So um, back in 2004, when they came out with the first requirements, it was a little bit different than what we have now. They've, they've made some changes. But this is from the 2012 edition. It's the most recent. This is what uh, we surveyed to. So you're going to see the first one is where installed in a corridor. Uh, the corridor is going to be six feet in width. Uh, maximum individual dispenser fluid capacity, uh, 1.2 liters uh, for dispensers in rooms and corridors, and two liters for dispensers in suites uh, of rooms. So we're really talking about the ones that you see in healthcare. There's many uh, major uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, then they're, they're attached to the wall. 
Uh, this is not, uh, I have two teenage daughters, so I find, uh, you know, glitter hand sanitizer, uh, ones that smell differently that they have, uh, you know, throughout the house. Yeah, we're talking uh, two totally different things. Uh, as you know, in healthcare, it's very much more regulated. So we're not looking at the, the ones that uh, you, you find as, as similar in your home. We're really finding the ones that you're going to find in hospitals, in nursing homes, and surgery centers that are um, made and uh, just for uh, you know those uh, uses. So where aerosol containers are used, maximum capacity shall be 18 ounces and limited to level one for NFPA 30B. So you can use aerosols. You just want to make sure that we're meeting these requirements, and whoever your manufacturer is should be able to, to show you that they're, they're meeting those requirements. Um, dispensers must be at least four feet apart. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It doesn't mean you go down your hallway and put them every four feet. Uh, we do have some requirements that uh, limit how many you can put in there, but um, they have to be at least four feet apart for fire safety purposes. Uh, so there's, we'll go over this, but the, the area is highlighted in yellow. That's one of the other big takeaways uh, that I have for you today. So you see it says not more than 10 gallons of solution or 1,135 ounces of level one aerosols or a combination of the two shall be used outside of a storage cabinet in a single smoke compartment, which we'll talk about a smoke compartment, with the following exception. You can have one dispenser per room and located in that room shall not be included in the uh, total. So you can go and put one dispenser in each room, and it's not counted towards the 10 gallons that you can have outside of the room. Uh, it's a common misconception. A lot of people think they're limited by how many rooms they have in their smoke compartment. And when we talk about smoke compartment in healthcare, we do a lot of defend in place. Uh, so I have a little bit of a floor plan here. So you know, typically, um, it gets a little complicated when you're starting to look at smoke compartments. So as a facility, if you're looking to figure out how much you can have per smoke compartment, First thing you really have to do is figure out where your smoke compartments are. Um, every facility is required to have a portable life safety code plan, such as this one, where it shows your smoke compartments. So you'll see here that uh, this facility is kind of uh, broken into two so that there is some type of fire. They can evacuate from one side to the other. So when we talk about how many uh, hand sanitizers you can have per smoke compartment, we're doing one here on this side, you see on the left, and one on the right-hand side. You could have 10 gallons total on either side. Um, so when you're looking and doing these calculations and trying to figure out how to set up your facility, this is one of the first things you need to do is pull out your life safety code plan and say, okay, where are my smoke compartments at? Now I can start figuring out where I can install um, the hand sanitizers. You'll see storage greater than five gallons in a single smoke compartment must comply with NFPA 30, which means you have to put it in a rated storage cabinet. Um, so the storage cabinet will say right on it that it's NFPA 30 compliant. So if you, uh, if there, I guess if there's a big sale and you have them in your clean linen room or wherever you're storing them, you just want to make sure that if you go over five gallons, you have to have it in the cabinet. Um, that's rated for NFPA 30. Uh, dispensers cannot be installed one inch above, below, or to the side of an ignition source. When the regs first came out, they said six inches, so some people might say six. Uh, that's fine with me as long as it's at least one inch away. Because one of the first things we want to do is we want to install the, um, the, the hand sanitizer right uh, at the doorway when you're coming into the room, and that's right where you also have your light switch. Uh, so we just have to make sure that we're installing them uh, away from the light switches, and you'll see a picture later that will kind of give you a, a nice guidance on the one inch above, below, or to the side. Um, dispensers cannot be installed over carpet unless you're fully sprinklered. We don't see a ton of carpet in healthcare, but you will see them sometimes uh, in our areas maybe where you're, you're uh, doing registration and waiting. So we just want to make sure that if those areas aren't sprinklered, then we can actually have the dispensers installed over carpet. Uh, the solution shall not exceed 95% alcohol content by volume, which is an increase in from the past, so, uh, so we're in pretty good shape there. Um, and because we are uh, rule makers, we like to make lots of rules. So these are um, uh, in here. Some of them are a little bit harder to uh, you know, try to make sure that we're in compliance with, but this is really something where the manufacturer uh, is going to you know, make sure that you're in compliance, and this is why we buy uh, you know, from manufacturers that are familiar with healthcare, not going to, uh, you know, I see a sale and uh, I'm gonna go to Costco, Walmart, or wherever, and Target and, and buy a bunch. 
Uh, they're not made to the same standards, so we just want to make sure that we're meeting these requirements. First one saying dispenser should not release its contents except when uh, it is activated uh, by manual or touch-free activation. Uh, activation shall only occur when an object is placed within four inches of the sensing device. An object placed within the activation zone should not cause more than one activation. Uh, so if you leave your hand in there, it shouldn't just keep dispensing. Um, and the dispenser shall not dispense more solution than the amount required for hand hygiene consistent with label instructions. That's uh, that's the one that's a little bit uh, you know tiff, or tough to, to to figure out if we're compliant with, but that's where we really have to rely on our our manufacturers to make sure that they uh, have dispensers that are working properly. And um, the dispenser shall be designed, constructed, operated in a manner that ensures that accidental or malicious activation of the device is minimized. And that's something that we need to really look into as well. If you have a behavioral health unit. If you have an area that's a pediatric, we're worried about kids trying to, to get in. You know, uh, maybe we don't have uh, these uh, dispensers in areas where uh, you know the, these folks can get in and uh, you know do something. Uh, you know, either try to drink out of the dispenser or uh, you know something else. So we just want to be careful on some of the locations that we put them. And the dispenser shall be tested in accordance with the manufacturer's care and use instructions each time a new refill is installed. So most people don't uh, under, uh, realize this, but there is um, you know, this you know, requirement that every time you, you replace it, uh, whoever's replacing it should be making sure that they, they test it to make sure it's working properly. So I try to keep things uh, simple. Um, and uh, for me, it was kind of like algebra going from liters to gallons, but I checked my math a couple times, uh, or quite a few times to make sure I get the information correct. But if you're doing the math, uh, I know it talked about two liter dispensers, but that was for suites of rooms, which gets into a lot of life safety code terminology and is a little difficult. So I just catch it to 1.2 liter dispensers. So you could have 10 gallons per smoke compartment and use it in storage, which is 31 1.2 liter dispensers. So the first thing we have to remember is that one dispenser per room does not count towards the total. So everyone that's you have where you just have one dispenser, if you have more than one dispenser in that room, then uh, however many more that you have than one does count, but one dispenser per room does not count. So we take those out. Uh, rooms have four walls and a door. So if you're in an emergency department where you might have uh, privacy curtain and bays, uh, so it can make it a little bit more challenging uh, because those won't count as rooms. And then storage within a fire rated cabinet does not count towards the total. So you can have up to five gallons um, in a storage room without being in a cabinet. But if you want more dispensers out on the unit or out in your area, then the idea is to put those five gallons in a rated cabinet so that you can get the full 10 gallons uh, in use uh, out in uh, the, you know, the healthcare area where we're providing care. So uh, there it is, it's 31 uh, that you can go to. And just remember, we, ha we highlighted earlier that uh, the one per room does not count towards that total. So here's the uh, picture I promised earlier. We're here showing a uh, electrical receptacle, but also a light switch or anything else that uh, might be an ignition source. Um, so even you see how the green extends above. So if your outlet's down by the floor, you still need to stay one inch uh, over to the side. Um, and then the other question we get quite a bit is in reference to carts and installing uh, hand sanitizers on carts. Um, so movable carts and additional uh, dispensers in a room. So how do we handle those? Uh, so I, like we said before, trying to keep it simple, uh, I would recommend using you know, the same dispensers throughout. That way you're ordering the same ones. They're all the same uh, type. If you want to use something different, there's nothing saying that you can't have different types of dispensers throughout your facility. But for me, it just keeps it uh, more simple if we're, we were just staying with the, with the same one. Uh, whether it's on the wall or on a cart as well. Uh, count these dispensers in, in the total for your, your compartment, ensuring that you don't go over 10 gallons. So if you have a dispenser on a cart, um, and it's your anesthesia cart, it's your med cart, whatever type of cart it is, and you know it's going from room to room, or does it stay in just the room? If it's something that just stays in the room, we can count it as the one in the room. If it's uh, the second one in the room, then it's going to count towards that 31 total because there's you can only have one uh, free one in the room. If it's something that goes from uh, out in the corridor into different rooms, 
then we would definitely want to count it as one of our, our 31 uh, outside of the room. So have some policies and procedures in place just to uh, make sure you train your folks and, and everybody understands uh, you know, what your policies and, and procedures are. Um, but like I said, you can use the slides before to say that we're going to follow the requirements on how to install them. And here's how we installed them. You know, here are all the requirements uh, that I showed you in those, those slides. Uh, our storage is found in uh, Clean Utility Room you know, 100 uh, or wherever you have your storage. And you know, this is how much we're, we're storing there. Uh, like we said before, you could have that one dispenser located in, in most rooms, not counted towards the aggregate total, and rooms have four walls and a door. Um, additional uh, hand rubs can be found in quarters in the following locations uh, and counted towards the aggregate uh, total. So if you know we're going to keep um, yeah, some in the quarters and we're going to also have some on uh, carts that are in ORs, you know, one through ten, then we want to just make sure that, you know, that uh, you know, these are the ones that we have. Um, we want to stay under that 10 gallons or less, and then just make sure that we train everybody uh, so that you know everybody understands. Okay, I have it on this cart, so I can't push the cart up against this wall over here because I have all these electrical receptacles, and I still need to make sure I'm not, you know, you know, put it within an inch of an electrical receptacle. Um, and you know that way, uh, one, they are familiar with where they're at; they can use them. Uh, because even though on the fire safety side we worry about the, the you know the threat of fire and spreading the fire, it's yeah we understand that um, you know it's a it's a great product to use um, in healthcare and we want you to use it. Uh, we you know, we want to uh, you know you know keep those infections down. So um, we just have to make sure that we we follow those rules to to stay in compliance in both the fire safety side as well. So in emergency preparedness. Um, the uh, the rule came out 11-16-2016 uh, was when it became final, um, and and they've made a number of changes to the uh, what they put out to try and clarify CMS has. Uh, when their last clarification came out um, in uh, in February of this year, and uh, for those of you that are familiar with CMS, they used to have uh, they used to call them S and C letters, but now they they changed their name to QSO. Um, so now there are QSO, and this is 19, all emergency preparedness updates to Appendix D of the State Operations Manual. And Appendix D in the State Operations Manual, they tell uh, states how to survey facilities. Uh, so you're getting the same information that we're getting on, on how to survey facilities. So we'll um, have some updates to include emergency and, um, emerging infectious diseases. Uh, there's some things for new home health agencies. So if you're a home health agency, it's, there's some uh, information out there for you. And they tried to clarify some um, uh, generator and alternate source of power. I think they made it a little bit more confusing, so we'll try to make it uh, less confusing. Um, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so you'll see here uh, in their definition for CMS for an all-hazards approach to your emergency preparedness plan, that they added planning uh, for using an all-hazards approach should also include emerging infectious diseases, EIDs. Uh, so uh, examples of EIDs include uh, influenza, Ebola, Zika virus, and others. Uh, if you need information on those, the, the uh, CDC is great. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control is great to, to go to and, and get that information. Uh, they have uh, all sorts of uh, great information on all of these. This is uh, TAGS, uh, so this is be a deficiency tag E0004 uh, for emergency preparedness surveys. And you'll see it applies to all facility types with the exception of transplant centers. And what they did is when you're, they're saying when you're doing your all hazards approach to your plan and you're developing your plan, you'll see there's natural disasters, man-made disasters, loss of power, and then at the end they added EIDs such as influenza, Ebola, Zika virus, and others. So this is something uh, new, um, and then we want to make sure that everybody adds it uh, to their plan. And you know, if you haven't had your survey uh, since, uh, if you had a survey before February, you wouldn't have seen this. But after February, uh, this is something we're looking for in everybody's plan. Uh, this is tag E0015, um, and here uh, where they added the red text is, is the new text that they really tried to, to clarify. So we'll go over this. Um, 
the same facilities are not required to upgrade their alternative energy source or electrical systems, but after review of their risk assessment, they might, uh, they might think, you know what, I do need to upgrade my, uh, my system. Uh, and an example of this would be uh, if you're a facility uh, that has either limited emergency power or you have a generator but maybe it just powers lighting and some uh, select receptacles, if there is some type of loss of power, then your first, um, the first thing you have to look at is uh, when am I going to start evacuating uh, the residents, the patients, the clients, depending on your facility type. Because if you have no power and it's just doing lighting, and here in Pennsylvania we have the four seasons, so it could be really hot in the summer. Uh, it's supposed to get really hot later this week. And it's, it's going to be one of those things where, you know, how long can we keep folks in here where until it gets, you know, started getting too hot? Or, uh, you know, uh, no sooner than uh, you turn around, it's going to be freezing cold. Uh, so we have, the, you know, the area there too. So when facilities are looking at their, their risk assessment, they might say, I don't really want to um, evacuate right away when we lose power, so let's look into adding to our emergency power system. But if you don't add to your emergency power system and, and then your, your emergency power system does uh, kind of minimal uh, requirements, then you're, you're just going to have to make sure your plan says that uh, we're going to start evacuation uh, pretty much as, uh, you know, as soon as we get out of the temperature range. And it, the only ones that really have a temperature range uh, that's written in is uh, long-term care facilities. You'll see 7181, but that's kind of a, you know, a good guide. Uh, so if you start saying, you know, we're going to start dropping uh, into the 60s or we're going to get uh, you know, into mid-80s or, or higher, we really should start looking at um, evacuating uh, the, 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 uh, the, the patients in our facility or the residents uh, in, in our facility. Um, if uh, you're a surgery center, it might be a little bit easier where you can just say, I'm going to stop doing procedures, I'm not going to have anybody else come in, and we're going to evacuate. But facilities that have overnight stay, it just becomes a little more difficult. And you'll see here, everybody's set up so much uh, uh, differently. Some places will have common areas that have heat and cooling. Some places will have, you know, more areas that are that they heat, can heat and cool. But all depending on what your facility uh, is like and how they're set up, uh, we can have the ability to to keep folks in there longer if we have the ability to heat and cool. But if we don't have that ability, then we have to make sure that we understand that we have to start our evacuation plan. And that's really truly what they're trying to to say here in all this extra red text. So uh, here again, um, they added a little bit of a uh, new text to talk about, excuse me, portable and mobile generators rather than a permanent generator. And we really, uh, I just want to clarify that yeah, this is not going to uh, you know, some type of uh, store and buying something off the shelf and you know, running in and, and, and you know, plugging everything in into the outlets on that type of generator. This is more of a portable generator for example, down in Philadelphia where we had um, a loss of power from a steam line and the uh, power companies themselves said, hey, we're going to bring a generator in because you lost power. Um, and then we hook it into the, you know, the, the power system, the electrical system at the facility. So these are, are more of what we're looking at. And when we go through these requirements, you can kind of see why. So if you're using a portable generator, uh, they're listing some of the wiring and where you can locate it and the you know, ventilation, obviously, you're not putting the generator inside uh, and you're having the exhaust issues. Um, and then some of the big things you're going to see here, no extension cords could be used with the portable generator. So we're not talking about uh, one that you might have, you know, at your hunting camp or uh, if you have a camp route somewhere. These are more um, uh, if you have an emergency, your local power company brings a portable generator in. They're trying to say that's acceptable. Um, and they're trying to kind of give leeway for, for facilities to say, uh, yes, somebody brought in a generator, but no, you don't have to maintain it the same way because uh, there's annual you know, maintenance that we're not going to ask you for because it was just a, a temporary generator during that time frame. Um, this one sounds like a lot of common sense, um, but a, a CMS added it. So if your local community, region, or state declares a state of emergency and is requiring a mandatory evacuation of the area, you really should evacuate. Uh, so they added that to tag uh, E18. Uh, this one's pretty good for um, 
if you have multiple facilities and you have staff to go be uh, between them, uh, so this in this case is they're talking about a nutritionist at a, an ICF, an immediate care facility. Um, so if you have contracted individuals that are providing services at multiple facilities, they're not go, we're not going to ask you to, to have them uh, trained at every single facility. So we don't expect them to go to if they go to five different facilities to go to five different trainings, but we do expect them to go through a training. Uh, and that they, they know their role in an emergency uh, plan. And uh, when we interview them, uh, we expect them to, to understand what their role is um, and how, you know, that they did go through training, but we're not looking for them to get trained at each facility because uh, it could be really re redundant in, uh, in training. This is just clarification that if you um, uh, in the past, it said if you had a, an actual emergency, you can count that as one of your two drills for the year. Um, now they're saying if you have uh, two emergencies, not only are you super unlucky, but you can use, them, uh, use those as both of your uh, drills, uh, your community-based full-scale exercise and your facility-based uh, bomb disaster drill. If you have two emergencies in that same year, you could uh, use those emergencies in lieu of having to do um, any exercises. Uh, here again, we're talking about uh, generators, and this part is more about maintenance. And what we're saying is there's a different maintenance for portable generators, and we're not expecting you to maintain the same as a generator that you would have uh, on site at your facility uh, as permanently installed. Um, and here again, it's pretty much uh, the, you know, the same thing. Uh, so there are requirements for portable generators, but they're not the same as for uh, permanently installed generators. If you have any questions, uh, I guess I, I should really probably uh, get this updated in case some of the names have changed, but our healthcare coalition contacts, and this is from uh, 2018, but uh, I'm sure the, uh, if you call in and there's a different uh, name or number, they can, they can get you that for you. But if you look on here and see you know, what uh, area you're in uh, and you call up, uh, these are uh, great resources. Uh, they'll help you with your plan. They'll help uh, you know, conduct uh, the drills, uh, letting you know when other folks are doing drills. So you can really uh, talk to these people, email them. Uh, I would pick their brain if you have any questions uh, because you know, this is you know, really what they're out there for and uh, they really want to help out. So the CMS 2012 Life Safety Code Adoption. So some of the things that we want to stress uh, here is uh, if you uh, that we're going to go over are some of the, the requirements that have changed. Uh, if you really want to read the whole rule, it's quite a few hundred pages. It'll probably help you go to sleep at night. Uh, so the link is in there. And, and you know that you know, CMS, um, and when they did adopt it, they didn't adopt everything. So there are some things that are a little bit different. They made a couple of changes to, to make it their own. And those can all be found uh, at the final rule uh, at that link. And here's another example I talked earlier where I talked about uh, making sure you had the book. Um, so one of the changes that they made that I think is a really good change is that all K tags are, are three digits and organized by life safety code section, uh, subsection, and then the numeric order in that subsection. So if you've been around like me, uh, you know K18 is always corridor doors, but uh, you're going to see that that was changed to K363, and we'll, we'll show why. Uh, K29 was hazardous areas, now it's K321. But the really neat thing is you open your book, and if you got cited for K363, you can go, if you're an existing um, hospital, nursing home, healthcare facility, you can go to Chapter 19, which is the existing healthcare occupancy, and you go to 3.6.3, and you got cited for corridor doors, and you can read down through the, the requirements for corridor doors. So in the past, uh, it was just a number. Now that number actually takes you to the book and takes you to the section of code. And it's, uh, it's really nice to, to have, especially if you have that book, uh, so you know what you're getting surveyed to. Uh, like we said, here's K321. Uh, it's hazardous areas. But uh, rather than just knowing that uh, through memorization, you can actually open the book and see here again, we're in the existing facility, Chapter 19. Uh, existing healthcare occupancy, and we're going to 3.2.1, uh, which is hazardous areas, and then you can read down through 
and see uh, what the requirements are for hazardous areas. One of the things that uh, has been a, um, uh, a huge uh, change and has been uh, one that's been kind of difficult for cities to, to meet because it was not something that uh, was part of the survey process before, but you'll see that fire rated door assemblies have to be inspected and tested in accordance with NFPA 80. Uh, so NFPA 80 is a separate book from NFPA uh, 101. Um, and it uh, talks about fire rated assemblies to include doors. And this was added to the survey process in uh, November in 2016. You'll see some pictures here. It's not just closing doors, and then we'll go over the, the requirements. Uh, you're measuring gaps. You'll see there's gaps at the bottom of the door, the side of the door. Uh, the one gentleman there is looking at the, um, the self-closing device on the door. So there's a lot of things that we have to, to look at here. First thing that's very important applies to new and existing installations. A lot of times new requirements only apply to new facilities or new installations, but this one applies to new and existing. Inspected and tested not less than annually, so we should have already gotten uh, two uh, in, but we're, uh, we're still going to uh, go over these because it's something that uh, a lot of uh, facility types are, are struggling with trying to make sure that they're, they're meeting the requirements. A written record shall be signed and kept for inspection by the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, and then this is a comprehensive document. It's not just a checkbox saying, uh, today Charlie checked all the doors. This is uh, you know door one at this location. This is what we checked it for. Here's the date. Here's who checked it. And it's going to talk about functional testing by knowledgeable individuals. Uh, and a lot of questions about that. What is a knowledgeable individual? Um, and this is something that we do through the survey process, uh, through the interview process, like we talked about earlier, in, in reference to we're going to do an interview with the staff saying, okay, uh, so you're the one that tested these doors. Uh, let's go to a door. Okay, this door has an astragal. And if they can't explain how they uh, tested the astragal, then we're going to start wondering, you know, if they should be the ones uh, testing the doors. You can get certified. Um, I will. Um, uh, I've been to a two-day uh, door class, fire door class. Um, uh, they have since made it a one door, one day door class. I'm, I've been told, which, uh, in my opinion, is a very good thing. Uh, two days on fire doors is, is a little long. Uh, it was extremely good, uh, but there was way much. Um, there's a whole lot of information. There's a lot of information that I didn't know I needed to know, uh, but now I do know it uh, on fire doors. So you can have the training and say that, uh, you know, here it is, I'm certified, and if you want that information, you can always, uh, my contact information is at the end, but it doesn't require that you have to be trained and, and certified. And then repairs should be made without delay. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, doors are very, especially fire-rated doors, uh, they're you know, typically made to order. It's very hard to, to get them uh, without the uh, delay. So it's one of those things where we're showing we did order the door, the door's coming in. Uh, if you're a nursing home, you might need a time limit waiver because if it's going to take more than 90 days to get in and get installed. So there's a lot of things uh, with that, but without delay, uh, we're really looking to make sure there's some type of paper trail showing that we're at least working to get that door uh, fixed or uh, replaced. Uh, so on your swinging doors, uh, so before you uh, test the door, you have to do the visual inspection of both sides. You know, they're talking about no holes. If you have light uh, vision panels, we're looking at those. Uh, no visible signs of damage to the door. No parts are missing or broken. Uh, door clearances are appropriate. And door clearances, uh, there are, depending on the, the type of door, uh, where the, the clearance is being measured, there's lots of uh, different clearances that uh, have to be uh, maintained. Uh, so those are the ones, if you have double doors, there's a gap between the doors. So there's a lot of... Um, door clearances that whoever's testing these, they need to understand uh, what the clearances need to be. Um, so if the closing device uh, is operating properly, um, that one's a little bit easier. So if you have a coordinator, the coordinator's working, uh, latching hardware, uh, no auxiliary hardware installed that would interfere with the proper operation of the door. So, uh, you know, when we're putting the, you know, the, the wreaths on or other decorations, um, it's one of those things that, you know, that might be something that you can't uh, close the door. It's very important that you don't have something on there that's going to keep the door from closing. 
And it's also something that you see a lot of wedges, uh, door wedges, where they're, they're wedging the door open, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, those are not only bad for the, for the door, you're really hurting uh, the hinges, but it's also uh, you know, not allowed. And you see no field modifications that would void the label. So uh, a lot of the manufacturers will tell you that you can't do pretty much, you can't, there's not really much you can do to a door uh, that, uh, you know, if you wanted to make any changes to the door, it's really the manufacturer or their representative that can do it. If you do it yourself, you could be voiding the label on the door. And then if you would have a fire, they're going to say, uh, well, you made a change to the door, and we don't know if that, do that door wasn't tested that way, so we're not sure if it's going to work properly. Um, gasketing and edge seals are required or inspected. So here again, you know, if we have gasketing, we just need to make sure it's uh, properly rated for the door. And you'll see similar requirements for horizontal sliding, uh, vertical sliding, and rolling doors. Um, and then, you know, it's one of those where um, anybody in the healthcare, uh, you know, industry knows you could go around and probably check the doors in, in the morning. And, uh, you know, somebody has a cart, they knock into the door, the door no, you know, is no longer latching. A resident's family might uh, have a nice little brick that somebody knits their initials into and then puts the brick into that and puts it in front of the door. Um, but you just want to make sure that staff, you know, even, you know, not just your maintenance staff, but uh, whether it's the nursing staff or other folks that are on the floor, you know, if they, they see a door, you know, and maybe it keeps, you know, creaking close, you know, creeping closed instead of staying open, rather than somebody wedging it open, it might be something good to pass on to maintenance or, you know, if the, you see somebody, you know, smack the door with a card or somebody's trying to hold the door open while they're, you know, putting supplies in and out of a, a storage room, uh, you know, maybe they're just better ways than, than um, uh, the things that they're doing so that they don't, you know, uh, do anything to the doors that would damage them and then require you to spend a lot of money to, those fire rated doors are expensive, so uh, we don't want to have to be replacing them all the time. Um, so in the 2012 uh, NFPA uh, Healthcare Facilities Code, NFPA 99, uh, what you're going to find is testing for your medical gas systems are supposed to be conducted by, uh, they're saying, a party that's technically uh, competent, and then they have to meet the requirements of ASSE 6030. So here you're going to see, uh, before we talked about knowledgeable individual, here you're going to see that they actually say uh, whoever's doing your, your verification, your testing in this case, has to meet uh, ASSE 6030. So that's going to be part of the paperwork that we look at when we come do your survey if you have medical gas in your building. Um, very similar, persons maintaining the system, they have three options here. One is training and certification through the healthcare facility. That's something we'll talk a little bit on the, on the next slide. Uh, also, you have uh, the two requirements, 6040 or 6030. So we're really looking to see anybody that's maintaining your system has those uh, qualifications, and we will ask for those qualifications. If you're going to try and do training and certification through the facility, you might have a, you know, some hospitals out there have a program uh, where they've had somebody that's been, uh, you know, in testing, maintaining, or they might be maintaining the um, uh, medical gas system and they've been doing it for 20 years and it's just something that they, they learned on the job. So we're just going to try and see, you know, if you're going, you know, new folks, what the training program and what the policy procedures uh, to make sure that you're demonstrating compliance with training. Or like we said before, you can meet those, those two requirements and, and not have to worry about training and certification at the facility. This is important for medical gas systems that have uh, booms, non-stationary booms. So if you have booms, uh, you're going to have uh, flexible hoses, uh, flexible connectors, and they added a new requirement uh, that uh, every 18 months, or if we can have some type of risk assessment done, but I would start with 18 months that you have to have these flexible connectors uh, inspected. Uh, so this is something that was added in, so we need to make sure it's uh, getting done uh, because with the uh, adoption of 2016 of the, the Life Safety Code and the Healthcare Facilities Code, this is now something that facilities are being surveyed for because it's been 18 months, well over 18 months since the adoption. So you're going to see there's quite a bit of uh, requirements on this. Um, so we, uh, I put all the requirements in so you can see what they're supposed to be doing. But the important thing is if you have 
uh, you know, booms out there, you need to make sure that we're, we're checking the flexible connections. 2010 NFPA 10 is for fire extinguishers. Uh, so some of the ch changes that they made um, is the folks that are doing uh, your, your one year or maybe your hydrocyte testing, the other testing, uh, not the folks that do the monthly quick checks, but everybody else other than the monthly quick checks has to be certified in NFPA 10 principles. So they want to, um, so when we're going out and we're doing our, uh, your fire extinguisher inspection, one of the requirements that we're going to ask is saying that, um, you know, uh, who did your fire extinguisher testing uh, on annual and where is their certification? In the beginning, we've had a lot of folks try to say, well, I'm certified, uh, I trained somebody else, no, we're looking for the person that was on site. Um, so one of the big changes um, that you'll see as well was with privacy curtains. So I've been warning people, uh, if you see a big sale on privacy curtains, it's probably because they meet the old requirements but not the new, but um, the new uh, requirement is that the mesh has to extend down to 22 inches uh, from the ceiling. So uh, this is only applies for, for new curtains. So you can still have existing curtains with 18 inches of mesh, but uh, the new requirement is 22. So if you renovate, build new, we're gonna be looking for 22 inches and you'll see that mesh at the top of the privacy curtain. You can also drop the fabric curtain down as well, but the new requirement is, is 22 inches. And you'll see here, it uh, specifically says newly introduced uh, curtains have to comply with NFPA 13. So that's where we're, we're uh, only looking at new. Um, so we've always talked about the 18 inch rule. We're always trying to keep 18 inches down from the sprinkler. Is it now the 22 inch rule? is no, the 18 inch rule still applies to everything else, but they did some studies and they found that privacy curtains, we needed to get the mesh down to 22 inches to get the proper sprinkler coverage on either side of the curtain. So um, this is something you have a little bit of time on. Uh, so you're looking at uh, November of uh, 2021, but I recommend uh, not everybody waiting or the sprinkler companies uh, probably know that you need to have it done and they'll charge you extra. But internal inspection of the piping uh, was as added. So that's every five years, you're gonna see, you're gonna have to do this uh, additional test. And it's, um, it's one of those things that once they uh, open it up, uh, there, there might be more things that they have to do. Uh, so uh, if anybody's ever seen sprinkler water, it's not the, the, the you know, something you're gonna wanna drink, it's not the, the, the prettiest water out there. But what you wanna find is, um, uh, you just want to make sure that your facilities are, your sprinkler companies are aware that you have to do this five-year test and that uh, you definitely want to make sure you get it done by uh, November 2021 uh, because that's when uh, we're going to start surveying for that. So you have, do have a little time uh, for that one. So the last couple slides here are in reference to uh, some of the changes that were made that um, I'm not sure a lot of uh, folks know that could save you some money, uh, especially with the maintenance timeframes, and then we'll open it up for questions. But uh, this is NFPA 25, 2011 uh, edition, sections 5.3 and 8.3. So one of the things you're gonna have to check to see if you have, but if you have a electric motor driven uh, pump assembly for your sprinkler system, um, the requirements was changed from weekly to, to monthly. So a lot of people are still out there doing it the, the old way, they're still doing it weekly. That's fine, you could do it daily if you want, but you're now allowed to go out to, to monthly and maybe you can uh, use that time uh, uh, doing some other maintenance. Uh, one of the other things that have changed that uh, uh, really hasn't changed with anybody, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks still doing it the old way, um, and is that your semi-annual testing of vein type and pressure switch type water flow alarm devices on your sprinkler system so the previous requirement was quarterly, and that was the main driver of the where we asked you for your quarterly sprinkler inspections, um, but <clears throat> they now are at semi-annual. So there's a good chance that uh, you talk to your sprinkler company that you could be doing your sprinkler uh, inspections semi-annually instead of uh, quarterly like before. But uh, like I was saying, you know, sometimes when you've been doing it for 20 years and it's always been quarterly, you're more than welcome to keep it that way but um, they, uh, there is the ability to go to from quarterly to semi-annual. And this is uh, back to <clears throat> the generators. Uh, so if you have a diesel generator, uh, does not maintain the minimum gas temperatures as recommended 
or does not reach at least 30% of the uh, nameplate um, during your monthly generator exercises. Uh, what happens is <clears throat> when the uh, diesel doesn't burn properly, it can wet stack and, and uh, get in your exhaust and can cause a lot of problems when you do need your generator to run. So there's an annual load bank exercise. Um, and in the past, that was two hours. You'd have to, uh, somebody would come in and they would have a load uh, that they could put on your generator and they would run it at different percentages for different time periods uh, for a total of two hours, which is the old standard. So now it's down to 1.5 hours. So if you're one of the facilities that has a diesel generator and you always have the, the load bank test, note that you can uh, save yourself uh, some fuel and, and hopefully some money and go down to 1.5 hours. So at this time, uh, there's, uh, we're in the question and answer session. Yes, thank you. This is Terry Lee. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Again, please hover over the bottom of your screen and you'll see three dots. Click on the dots to open the Q&A panel and direct your questions to all panelists and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. And Charlie, we do have some already. Um, the first two were back when we were talking about the alcohol-based hand rub. Um, you had mentioned that we did not permit alcohol-based hand rub over carpeted areas. Does that include throw rugs? So I would, um, in my personal opinion, I, I would say uh, yes. So we wouldn't want the throw rug right underneath the um, uh, hand sanitizer for the same purpose of it uh, being under uh, carpet. Um, um, I believe what the concern is the uh, sometimes when we have it on our hands, we're also when we're rubbing it, we're getting it on the wall, and also some of it's getting on the floor. So you don't want to have that potential for the the floor to to burn. Okay, thank you. And the next one again um, came in when we were talking about the alcohol-based hand rub. Um, the, the bathroom, the bathroom in the room, is that counted? in the room is what the question is. And I, I'm assuming what is being asked is when you have alcohol-based hand rub in the room, does the one in the bathroom count as well? Um, Brenda, maybe you can clarify that for me if, if I got that wrong. So I would, um, uh, so if the question is, can you have one in the bathroom and one in the room, I would consider that um, a two within that, that room. Um, so we would just have to make sure then that we calculate that per our, our smoke apartment. Thank you. Um, the next one is, can you clarify without repairs, um, this is in regards to the fire doors, without repairs made without delay, many fire door parts and hardware take four to six weeks to receive. And, and I think you did address that, um, but if you could just review that again. Yeah, and that's a great question. So. Um, I would say the important part is communication with your, your survey agency. So, um, so here in Pennsylvania, if, um, if it's going to take four to six weeks for some type of hardware to come in, uh, the biggest thing is making sure you communicate that in your plan of correction, saying, um, I, I did contact the, the door uh, hardware folks. It's something that has to be made. It's going to be shipped. This is how long it's going to take. And then uh, you know, this is who can install it for us and this is when they can come in. So unfortunately, it takes a lot of uh, work with the fire doors, uh, but in the end, fire doors, or when we talk about defend in place, are one of our, um, our, our biggest uh, protection measures out there. Um, so there's a lot of focus on, on making sure that we're, we're keeping those uh, up to speed. Okay, and Brenda did clarify it for us. We did answer that correctly for her, so thank you, Brenda. Um, the next one, if we could, Flip back to uh, slide number 54. Um, there's a question on slide 54, and it, should it say 2021? I'm not seeing the numbers yeah. on. Oh, we're, you're, you're way, that's on 39, so we need to go oh, forward. Okay. Keep going. Couple more. Right there. Okay. Um, so yeah. So um, this is one of those ones where, um, since the NFPA 101 2012 edition was adopted uh, on January uh, 
5th of um, uh, 2016, uh, where it says conducted every five years. The first one that we're going to really start enforcing is uh, five years from uh, 2016 date, so that would be 2021. So the, uh, uh, the question is right in the fact that that's the first year we're going to start asking for it, uh, starting July 5th and after, uh, and then it's going to be every five years after that. Um, so it'll, the requirement will start uh, five years from uh, January 5th, 2016. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you please review the requirements for the outside switch required for generators? Okay, um, so the emergency stop, um, there, uh, I would, there's a lot, a lot to this one, and there's some communication that I can send uh, from, uh, from NFPA and the Healthcare Interpretations Task Force, where they, they kind of talked about if you have your generator in some type of enclosure, uh, maybe you could put it on the outside of the enclosure compared to the outside of the building. But this one might be a better one if someone has a specific question to their facility that they, they, they call in or email afterwards so we could talk about their specific location. Okay, thank you. Um, next, as far as the qualified medical gas maintenance, does this mean that the maintenance personnel who change the tank system or are actual inspection? So for, for the medical gas systems, these are the, the folks that are uh, doing your annual testing and, and inspections, and you'll see like that 18-month uh, flexible connectors. It's going to be uh, those folks and also anybody that's um, working on a system, so that's a good question. It wouldn't be the uh, general changing out of your, your tanks. It's going to be uh, when they come in to either do some new uh, work to the medical gas system or it's going to be uh, the, the folks that come in to do the, the maintenance and the testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, do we have a 30-minute monthly load bank test on generators since we do this yearly? So you're, you're still doing us to do the, the monthly um, uh, and, and weekly maintenance. So there's still going to be your, 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 your runs other than the, the load bank at the end. The load bank's kind of extra if you're not um, uh, running the diesel enough that you're burning off all the carbon. So the, the problem that we're running is, uh, uh, so if your generator uh, meets the requirements not to have a load bank, you wouldn't have to, to do it at all but it's because the generator doesn't have, uh, sometimes the generator salesmen are very good and they sell you a much bigger generator than you need. Um, and then what happens is it doesn't run properly because there's not enough uh, load on the generator to do so. And that's when we have to do that extra load bank test. Okay. The next question is we have a facility that's doing renovations and they wanna make sure they understand that the mesh height for privacy curtains is now 22 inches. But if they have the 18 inches in the rooms that have not yet been renovated, is that okay? And the other great question is a uh, great group. So that, that is okay. So uh, as you go from uh, room to room, if you, uh, if you replace, uh, if you renovate uh, five rooms in a wing, but you don't get to the next five rooms for another couple months, it would just be uh, the five rooms at a time. Or if you just do uh, you know, one wing and replace it there, or just one room, uh, it would just be those spaces that you renovated. And the next question is, are you limited to one wall-mounted alcohol-based hand sanitizer dispenser in an operating room? So you're not limited, um, but what happens is the ones in addition to that one would count towards your 31 in that smoke compartment. So what we'd want to do is evaluate, you know, where your smoke compartment is, um, and then uh, we would add those to that uh, 31 total. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, we were told we needed an emergency stop button outside of the generator. Where does this need to be located? Yes, yeah, so each facility is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so the emergency stop button, uh, uh, those ones would probably be better if they say, here's where my generator is, here's where my building, can you, sh you know, we, we could see a plan or a picture and then we could talk about it. So the webinar will be ending soon. Um, but we have a time for a few more questions before we get to the end of the program, and, and I see we have several here. I will go ahead with those. Um, the, one uh, 
panelists asked, the two hour load bank is now one and a half hours. What about the four hour load bank every three years? Is that still a requirement? Right, so that is uh, still gonna be a requirement and that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. I probably should have that added in there uh, to that slide because uh, that one does stay as, uh, as every three years. Thank you. For boom testing, how is it typically performed by maintenance staff, special equipment, or manufacturer evaluation? So for the boom testing, this is uh, typically done by the certified individuals that test your uh, and inspect your medical uh, gas system on an annual basis. They just add the 18-month um, uh, boom testing for the flexible connections uh, in it as well. And it's um, something uh, from what I've told is in the past, there were some issues with the flexible connectors leaking. Um, so they had to add that to the, the, to the maintenance so that uh, we don't have a, you know, any of the dangers of uh, having the gas leaking inside and, and causing issues. Okay, this looks like a good question here. Corridor doors, such as a client bedroom that has a fire rating tag, does this door have to be inspected as part of the yearly safety, life safety inspection? Uh, the bedroom doors are not considered a fire barrier and do not have to be rated. Right, and that is a great question. So, um, we're, I've been trying to work with uh, with CMS. I know um, uh, Joint Commission, which might not uh, apply here, has put out some information that you can uh, kind of cover up the tag. Um, but there has been some um, a talk in reference to if the door is tagged, even though it's not a fire rated um, uh, a fire barrier, and it's but it's tagged anyway, that it should be uh, part of your survey program. Uh, we're trying to get something from CMS to try and, and put some information uh, out there about that uh, on what their expectations are, but that's been a little bit difficult. So uh, to be honest with you, since a lot of our facilities get surveyed not just by us, but also uh, CMS will come in afterwards, until we get something uh, from CMS, I would caution you if the door has a tag uh, I would I would still keep that as part of your your program until we can work to get some type of information from CMS, where maybe they'll permit the same thing as Joint Commission with covering the tag or or something similar. Well, thank you, Charlie. We had a lot of great questions. I think we were able to answer all of them. This concludes our webinar.